Welcome to the Texas Heart Institute educational programs featuring cardiology in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. The title of today's presentation is Cell Therapy to Modulate Inflammation. My name is Zvonimir Krajer. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and CHI Health Baylor St. Luke's Hospital. Joining me today is Dr. Stephanie Coulter. She's an assistant medical director at Texas Heart Institute and director at Center for Women's Heart and Vascular Health. And also she's a program director, Cardiova cardiovascular disease fellowship, as well as director of cardiology education. Joining us today is our special guest, Dr. Emerson Perrin. He's an interventional cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and CHI Health, St. Luke's Medical Center. He's also a medical director of Texas Heart Institute and medical director of Cardiac Cath Lab here in Houston, Texas. Welcome, Dr. Perrin. Thank you, glad to be here. So we would like to know uh, <clears throat> and get some information from you, uh, Emerson. What do we know about uh, cell therapy? You have been involved in Texas Heart Institute cell therapy projects uh, for many years, but now in the era of COVID, how can we use cell therapy to uh, treat this uh, serious condition? Well, you know, we've been working um, with cell therapy, uh, mainly for uh, heart disease. We are the Texas Heart Institute, and one of our main uh, areas of focus has been heart failure. And we really uh, uh, started the first trials, lead the world in, in cell therapy, for research for cell therapy in heart failure. We have three trials, one which is a phase three trial, that are gonna be unblinded this year. Uh, and so there's a lot of work going on there. Now, the the main focus at Texas Heart in terms of research is really innovation. And it's, and I'll get back to this, but there seems to be some very significant involvement of the heart in COVID infection. And, and there may be a role for cells in this. And I want to bring up the fact that uh, innate immunity, which is the immunity that we're born with, uh, the cells such as natural killer cells and monocytes uh, go around and, and are sort of our first uh, uh, defense and army against something like if we catch COVID-19. And actually our innate immunity is what will dictate if we get the infection and we're home for a little bit and we do okay, or, or if it's not that good, if we gradually go downhill, have to go into the hospital and have complications. So Cells are intimately involved in, in immunological defense. We are made of cells. And so it's, it's very um, uh, important to consider the role that uh, cell therapy might have uh, in this disease. So here on this slide, um, uh, when we think about um, why could these cells work? Well, there's many, many different kinds of cells and we've used different kinds of cells in cell therapy. And a specific kind of cell or a mesenchymal cell. And this slide is, is from a publication of ours back uh, uh, last in July of last year in, in circulation research. And it, it, it demonstrates the actions of a particular cell. This is a proprietary cell called an MPC from, from mesoblast. But the, the general properties of MSCs were, are, are, are possibly uh, felt to be similar. So here you can see that an inflamed heart actually uh, is something that gives off signals and that inflammation then acts upon these cells that we can uh, treat people with and in turn these inflammatory markers then transform the cell and have it then uh, secrete certain substances and you can see the uh, representation of a m1 macrophage uh, that is subsequently transformed into a, and or polarized towards an M2 macrophage, which is a, a healing, uh, an anti-inflammatory type of cell that instead of putting out pro-inflammatory uh, 
uh, cytokines and other things, puts uh, uh, out uh, healing and anti-inflammatory uh, um, uh, proteins such as IL-10, PDGF you see here, FGF2, and as opposed to the M1 type that uh, secretes like IL-6, uh, TNF-alpha, these things that we're used to seeing causing significant uh, inflammation and that are at the basis of, for example, in this case, of chronic heart failure, but uh, in, in general, uh, many diseases uh, have this sort of underlying pathogenesis. And so the effects of these anti-inflammatory uh, substances is great. And it's not only local, but they can have uh, effect in, for example, the vasculature. And I think this is a very important thing. Being able to uh, have an effect on endothelial health may be extremely important in these kinds of patients we're seeing. Um, so, um, so recently, in uh, last month, this was published in JAMA Cardiology by a group in Wuhan, and uh, in 416 patients. And this is very interesting. I mentioned that I get back to the issue of of, of cardiac involvement in COVID, and they looked at these patients and the patients that were hospitalized, the ones that had cardiac injury, and that's about. 20% of patients, uh, actually it was 19% uh, uh, of patients. And actually, if you had cardiac injury as defined by elevation and troponin, then your outcomes were significantly worse. So those patients with cardiac injury had a mortality of 51% versus those that didn't, that had a mortality of 4.5%. So uh, this has been, uh, this publication has is, is been uh, sort of a, uh, a red flag and has really caught the attention of a lot of cardiologists uh, around the world and really brought to the forefront that there may be cardiac involvement in COVID-19 or this may be a marker. So we don't really know to what extent the heart is involved but we know that when we see these markers of cardiac involvement, that these patients are at much higher risk uh, of having uh, complications. So Emerson, based on how we're watching the disease of COVID-19 um, make people ill, we're seeing patients, many patients, 80% that do well, that have minor symptoms, that escape hospitalization altogether. And then you see patients that have symptoms and fever and after five to 10 days have a sudden worsening in their respiratory state. When would you see and how would you use cell therapy in these patients with COVID-19 infections? Well, that's, that's a very good question. I think the the important part of the answer is that we, we want to, number one, identify those high-risk patients. And here's an example. For, for example, we can use troponin. And patients that are troponin positive are at high risk, even if they're not further down the road yet. It's a way to look at, uh, mm -hmm. in this study I showed you, people that were hospitalized and they have a positive troponin. So with a, a group of investigators around the country, we're working on uh, putting together a trial and getting it funded, and, and there'll be more on this, but um, to exactly uh, identify then this group of patients where we can act early, identify mm -hmm. the high-risk patients, and think of using uh, immunomodulatory or anti-inflammatory cell therapy, in this case, cells like these mesenchymal cells, to try to uh, prevent or attenuate uh, the reaction they can have maybe helping them with their hospital course and not going down the road of, uh, of no return. Emerson, I think it's super entertaining because if you look at the way we've used the antiviral therapies in very sick patients, the results have been really very unsuccessful and not very, um, I don't know, Optim I'm not that optimistic. Maybe I'm beginning to think that we're giving the antivirals too late when the inflammatory response is hyped up too much. And in fact, maybe even the viral load in these patients have already started to decline and the immune system has taken a ravaging toll on the lung. And that thinking outside the box, which is 
a unique um, skill set that Americans do to think about new ways to treat an unusual presentation of a, of a disease that we're watching unfold in front of us. So how would you administer the treatment? Well, so th this is sort of a fortuitous, um, a very fortuitous and kind of an interesting thing. So back in the beginning of cell therapy, uh, Josh Harris at the University of Miami, he, he did one of the first studies in, in, in heart attacks and using cell therapy. And at that time, he gave these kinds of cells, MSCs, and he gave them intravenously. Well, as we found out, giving intravenous cells is not a very efficient way to get them to the heart if you're having a heart attack. And very interestingly, these patients wound up, uh, it, didn't, it didn't have a significant impact on their heart function, but they all had improved, significantly improved pulmonary function tests. Because mm -hmm. when you give something IV, the lungs act as a filter, and these cells end up in the lungs. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it is uh, incredible that, you know, in, in the world of cardiology, we go through all these things to try to inject these cells in the heart, and it's kind of difficult to do. But here, we will be able to administer these cells intravenously, very quickly. This is a 10, 20 minute infusion, um, very simple, and these cells will go right where we want them to go. Uh, and, and, and hopefully uh, have an effect. I think that, that um, the, the lung parenchyma is, is, is a place where the cells would definitely be challenged with uh, a, a local inflammation that they could then react to and, 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 and respond to. So Emerson, another very important uh, question is, I believe, uh, and maybe you can uh, shed some light on it. Where do the cells come from that you would administer to your patients? Yeah, so um, the field in general, so we've been working on, on, on cell therapy for the heart for, you know, over 20 years. And, and in, in general, we've progressed to uh, using allogeneic cells. So we're not doing a cell harvest procedure on the patient to get cells to give it back to them. So that puts the, and these patients with COVID are, are very sick. And we don't want them to, uh, to be having um, uh, to go through anything extra. So an allergenic cell procedure is very simple. You have one donor that can, and from which you can create many, many cells and have a, a, a cell bank. And, and uh, so these cells exist. And almost like a drug, you, you predefine a dose. And then you could administer uh, these cells uh, very rapidly. So... Um, Basically, cells from a healthy young person uh, that can be given to all the patients. Uh, and, and it's important to mention in the, in the trials that we've done in cardiac therapy that um, these cells, these, particularly these mesenchymal cells, it's not like giving heart muscle cells that uh, the, the, the immune system reacts to. These, these cells sort of fly under the radar uh, uh, of, uh, of immunity, and there's not a rejection uh, kind of phenomenon going on uh, when you administer them. So they're very well tolerated, and the safety profile has been uh, excellent when we use these kinds of cells in, in patients for heart purposes. Is this a safe treatment, or will it hurt the patients in any way? Uh, well, you you never know, right? So I just can't affirm that it's safe. I can, I can tell you that um, over a thousand patients have been studied uh, with these kinds of cells in different trials around the world. And um, so they've been found to be safe. We really don't uh, have a reason to believe we would have any, any issues. Again, the immunologic issue uh, does not seem to be a problem. And we really haven't seen other safety issues. So based on that, I would think it would be a, a, a fairly safe treat. I have a question, Emerson. Do we have cells that are already harvested that could be used? Yes, we do. You know, the, the, the fundamental property of a stem cell is self renewal. Mm -hmm. And so when you get cells, they grow. And so it's, it's, it's obviously it's not easy. You have to know how to do this, and you, but you can create a bank of cells from one donor where you could treat a thousand patients. Mm. So yes, these cells exist. We've, 
different groups and we're part of different groups of, of investigators around the country. And so uh, that, that we have uh, deployed these kinds of cells treating other diseases uh, uh, recently uh, for anthracycline induced cardiomyopathy or other cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. So we have these treatments ready. So Emerson, is this a approach like one time treatment or would it have to be done uh, on multiple occasions uh, in this particular scenario when you're talking about COVID patient? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting point because um, we're, when you take medicine, you take it every day or every so, you know, so many hours apart and, and you keep repeating the treatment when you take pills and usually uh, medical therapy. And historically now, cell therapy has been usually one treatment. And we give patients mm -hmm. a, a one treatment. And in, in many uh, phase two signals, we've seen some very significant signals. Uh, in phase two trials, we've seen very significant signals uh, of that one treatment having a significant effect. So you could think that you could treat them once, uh, but you could also, you know, so this is not a, a, a set in stone, but you could treat them twice or maybe even three times. Uh, uh, and that's something that, you know, the, we do, especially in this uh, uh, sc scenario, really, we don't, the answer is that we don't know, but we could do it once, twice, three times. Uh, logistically, you know, you, you don't want to get in the way of the uh, sort of uh, housekeeping treatment of these patients that mm -hmm. may need a lot of care and they may be very sick uh, and, and burdening the, uh, the, the, the healthcare workers that are there at the bedside. So, uh, you know, we want to be, have something that is relatively easy to do. In which patients would you recommend administering these treat, this treatment? Um, well, I think, you know, we kind of already touched uh, on this uh, a little bit. And um, so th there's many approaches. And, and you brought up, Stephanie, the issue of, of how sometimes treating patients later on, uh, the fire is raging and, and mm -hmm. you know, it's beyond the capabilities of, of trying to put it out. So I think, especially in, in inflammation, the earlier, the better. So mm -hmm. if we have a means to identify a high-risk patient, and be able to treat him early before he's intubated, before they're on sub ventilatory support, that would be ideal. And that's how we would like to approach this. Let me ask you, and you have answered this in part, but it's very intriguing to me to figure out who is the best candidate and what kind of tools or uh, studies would you consider to screen those patients and to see which patient fits the best in this protocol. And the reason that I'm mentioning this is because there is enough evidence now from experiences, particularly from abroad, from our colleagues from Italy and also from China, that not all patients that have elevated troponin or even ST segment elevation have uh, occluded coronary vessels. As a matter of fact, some of the uh, researchers had found that up to 40% of patients that were thought to have a STEMI actually didn't have occluded vessel. So it could be due to myocardial injury per se, or microvasculature being the primary cause for that, or even uh, pericarditis. And uh, so uh, it, it's challenging to decide which patient therefore is the best candidate. And uh, I was thinking about an option of doing a cardiac, maybe, or coronary CT angiography and looking at uh, your FFR, and we do that routinely at our institution, and you can immediately figure out uh, who has true STEMI and who has some other causes, and then maybe streamline your treatment depending on the findings. Well, certainly the EKG can be confounding. And as you just said, there are many reports of, of EKGs that look like STEMI that really aren't, that may represent myocarditis or uh, perimyocarditis. Um, we could think about using some different inflammatory markers. Uh, yeah. Certainly uh, th those uh, need to be measured. I think a, a simpler imaging modality is echocardiography that's mm -hmm. widely available. And in our cath lab discussions and, and with, with investigators around the world actually uh, 
it, it, it's felt that doing a quick look echo is a very good way to distinguish somebody who's having a true uh, ischemic event, uh, such as a STEMI, from somebody who's having a more generalized kind of phenomenon. So I would think that definitely I would like to image these patients. Maybe echocardiography would be um, more apropos since it, does, it exposes less people. Uh, it's logistically simpler and, and the images can, are very uh, reliable. We can do a, a lot of measurements from these. And I think, you know, Stephanie's a, an expert in this, uh, uh, but we, we would be wanting to look at overall LV function as well as um, uh, LV volumes. And regional LV function. We actually ordered I don't know if you know this, Dr. Crazier, but we ordered 40 of those small little handheld echocardiogram machines that we can put in a, you know, a condom sleeve of some port so we can take it into the room and image the patient without exposing our equipment to disease and really without having to transfer the patient, which adds a complexity to spreading the virus within our hospital setting. So... There are other options, and I think we've been trying to avoid taking them to radiology as much as possible. Okay. Well, let me ask you, Emerson, another very important thing is, of course, this is probably the most important question that I have. When is this going to happen? When can we expect that this trial will be initiated? I wish my answer was tomorrow. <laughs> um, obviously, we're in a, in a, in a huge rush to, to get something going. Uh, there are, are several groups around the country that we're in touch with. There are different cell uh, protocols. Um, I wanted to make sure that we brought, sort of, sort of did an educational, put an educational spotlight on cell therapy in this setting because I think it may have an important role. So, so back to your original question. Um, we are, uh, we, you know, work, work through the weekend. We, we put together uh, protocol. We're looking at uh, funding mechanisms uh, and when different working with different investigators around the country. Um, and so I hope that we could follow uh, this video with another video pretty soon, uh, maybe giving you details of a trial that we have put together with the different investigators on and, and we can talk about exactly uh, what we are doing. So we are just being... Uh, you can know for sure that we're in a very, very big hurry to get this and, and bring something that we believe uh, might uh, play an important role in, in helping some of the, the patients that are at higher risk. Excellent. Uh, <clears throat> Stephanie, do you have any other question for Emerson? No, I, I, I do wonder if you could use your protocol somehow in conjunction with convalescent serum as a therapy for, you know, you get squash the immune system and give them an antibody. I have no idea, but at this point, we're looking for anything that can suppress the immune response or improve the outcomes in these patients. Because at this point, being a medical professional, watching as we have only really supportive care for critically ill people where the mortality in vented patients is in excess of 50% and all the studies that have been um, released to this point, we're hopeful that we're adding, you know, improvement to people's life expectancy when we add people to the ventilator. But I'm really worried and scared, honestly, that um, the therapies that we have to offer at this point are unfortunately not much better than we offered in 1918 during the flu epidemic the Spanish flu because all of our fancy science hasn't been put to good use at this point, maybe because we're too early in the epidemic to have tried anything new, but it doesn't appear that anything we're throwing at this virus is besides stay at home and social distancing is putting anything of an important into the, into the mix. So I, I entertain any courageous and creative ideas at this point, um, to prevent this immune response, which is so ravaging for which there's really no really good therapy. So. Well, science is the answer. Science is the answer. And innovation is where we need to go. Yeah. Um, and this could be um, 
one of the, the an application for cell therapy uh, that we we we're, we're, we have a lot of familiarity with it in in um, deploying this in this situation could be something that could have an impact. We need to we need to find out if that's the case. Very well, interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, Emerson, you've been a leader in this field, and uh, I think uh, with your leadership, we can certainly. Uh, expect that something positive will happen as far as this particular research project is concerned in very near future. And we thank you for your very valuable contribution to this Texas Heart Institute program uh, in cardiology in the time of COVID-19 and beyond. Uh, so we thank you also, Stephanie, for helping us uh, in making this uh, program uh, happen. And we will, uh, for those of you that have joined in, see you very, very, very soon with our new and uh, additional programs on COVID-19 and cardiology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye.